We have all heard about climate change, and many of us think a lot about it. To some, climate change might bring catastrophic consequences soon, unless we take very drastic and, uh, and hard measures against it. To others, it's more the policies against climate change that we should be worried about. These policies might ruin us, prevent uh, poor countries from developing. So if you don't know which of these views is the right, and you shouldn't, then it, this is like standing in front of two doors. Uh, you know that behind one of the doors, there's a catastrophe, but you don't know which. You know, the only thing you know is that you have to open one, and whichever you open, you're going to regret it, possibly very dearly. So that's, that's a definition of what we sometimes call a wicked problem. And many argue that climate change is such a wicked problem. The purpose of this talk is to convince you that there is a third door. We don't have to choose between these two doors. This third door provides uh, a good insurance. We're not going to regret very much choosing that, whatever turns out to be right in the future. So that's an insurance, and it is the third door, and it implies that climate change is not a wicked problem. Uh, climate change is surely for real. Uh, we need uh, to become climate neutral, and I will argue that we should do that uh, towards the middle of this century. Uh, this is surprisingly cheap, uh, and that's why I call it a cheap insurance. And that's the purpose of, of the talk today. Uh, uh, to support this view, I, I want to start with talking about what I call the ABC, ABC of climate change. So three important points that we need to bring with us when we talk, think about these things. The first, A, is that a substantial share of emitted CO2 stays in the atmosphere for a very long time, hundreds or perhaps thousands of years, and causing climate change, more warming of, of the world. That's, cli that's climate science A. Climate science B is that at any point in time, the amount of climate change is approximately proportional, proportional to how much emissions we have uh, uh, emitted since we started some 150 years ago or so. Uh, so that also implies that if we continue to emit CO2, the total amount is going to increase, uh, continuously changing the climate, making it warmer, and having more frequent extreme events. Not in jumps, but gradually over time. That's climate science B. Climate science C, that is that among, around these things, there is an enormous amount of uncertainty. Um, uh, the climate scientists, as represented by UN's climate panel, IPCC, provides uncertainty intervals. Uh, they say that if we double the CO2 concentration, and we have come around halfway to that, then very likely uh, that's going to lead to a global warming between 2 and 5 degrees Celsius. That's a pretty large range, two to five degrees. Um, uh, it includes the possibility that we, uh, we need to take very uh, urgent action, but it also includes the possibility that it's not that urgent. When we talk about the consequences of climate change for human welfare, then I would argue that actually the uncertainty is even larger. We need to think about consequences for humans uh, very far away into the future. And it's, it's simply extremely difficult to even think about the consequences of adapting to climate change, say, 20, 50, or 100 years from now. So it's very uncertain. We don't really know. Uh, what should you do uh, when you are in a situation with a lot of uncertainty? Well, quite often, the right answer is wait and see. Wait and see and try to figure out what's the right decision. In this case, 
wait and see is not a good strategy. Uh, and this is for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that these uncertainties that I have already talked about, these are not going to be resolved within uh, uh, a reasonable amount of time, say a decade or two. So we are not going to see by waiting. While we wait, the, the, uh, uh, we're going to continue to accumulate CO2, uh, and, and that's going to make the, the problems more severe. Uh, we don't know exactly how much, but it's going to be worse and worse over time. So wait and see is not a good strategy. It's not an insurance. It's actually quite risky, and it's not the third door. Uh, so instead, the key to unlocking the third door is to realize that the economy, our society, in the short run is very unflexible. But in the long run, it's the opposite. The economy is quite flexible. Uh, so that uh, manifests itself in many dimensions. Uh, one is the amount of labor required to keep our economy running, how much we need to work. And I think we all know that in the short run, the way to have higher income in the aggregate in the economy is to work more, have more people work and more hours. And we also know that fluctuations in economic activity are pretty proportional. They move one to one with how much we work. Sometimes in recessions, people get unemployed and work less and so on. And in booms, it's the opposite. So in the short run, the economic, uh, in the economic activity and the incomes we generate are proportional to labor. That's not true in the long run. In the long run, it's pretty opposite. Uh, over time, our incomes grow. We produce more and better stuff without working more. It's rather the opposite, actually. In most countries, we work, tend to work a little bit less over time. This uh, difference between the short run and the long run also holds for, uh, for, for energy and fossil fuel use. Uh, so, for example, if we take oil consumption. Uh, oil consumption in the short run is really necessary to keep our economy running and to quickly reduce the amount of oil, that's very difficult. That's going to have very uh, dramatic consequences for our economy. But in the long run, things are different. Uh, since uh, oil consumption per person peaked in EU and in the US, it's gone down by, by around 30%. And over that time, our income has actually doubled. So we produce twice as much. So this uh, flexibility in the long run is very important. <clears throat> and, and what's the reason for this difference between the short run and the long run? Well, the reason is that in the short run, in every point in time, we are stuck with the machines, with the infrastructure, with the type of cars, with the heating arrangements we have in our house, and the technologies that we have developed in the past. That's what we, are, what we have now. And this locks us in into, for example, energy use and what kind of energy we use. In, in the long run, for the future, things are different. We can decide what to invest in, we can decide which technologies to develop. That's not going to change things immediately. We cannot change our technologies, change our infrastructure and the machines over a year or two. But over 30 years, dramatic things can happen. Uh, if we think back, those of us who can think 30 years back in, in, in time, uh, we all realized that 30 years ago, things were very different. We didn't have electric cars, uh, uh, we didn't have internet, at least not much, uh, we didn't have streaming. Lots of stuff has changed over that time. And that can happen also in the future. <clears throat> uh, so, so we can move to a climate neutral society over the coming 30 years. <clears throat> and this is not just wishful thinking, this is actually how the models that we use to describe how our, our economies work uh, tell us that, uh, that they do. Uh, so this is not wishful thinking. 
Uh, we need to speed up, of course. Uh, I told you that we have uh, reduced our oil use uh, in the EU and the US uh, with time, but we need to do it a little bit faster. Uh, and these are challenges associated with this. The challenge is not so much that the transition is, is historically large. Uh, um, Compared to, say, industrialization or the, the current digitalization, I would argue that, uh, that uh, uh, the transition to climate change is relatively small. So that's not the, the challenge, that it's a very dramatic change of our economies. The challenge is that we need uh, everyone in society, consumers, investors, engineers, tech developers, and so on, to move in the same direction. Uh, we need to think that we are moving towards uh, a climate-neutral society step by step. Then that's not going to be difficult. Uh, for this, policy is needed. Uh, policy, political decisions that we are going in that direction are needed. Uh, and here, the credibility is the important thing. We need to be convinced that we are all going in that direction towards climate neutrality. Then things are going to work. Uh, so, uh, and I think the best system to do that is what's called an emission trading system. An emission trading system, uh, also sometimes called cap and trade, is uh, in principle relatively easy to understand. It's like a rationing system. So we, in, uh, in these systems, keep track of how much emissions are used. And for every emission uh, that is done, an, a, a, a rationing card has to be delivered to the government. <clears throat> and this, the amount of, of rationing cards, uh, it's not important that it's very tight in the beginning. There has to be a commitment that the number of emission allowances, rationing cards, go down over time in the right, uh, uh, in the right speed. And then everyone should be convinced that, you know, in the future we cannot use fossil-driven cars, we cannot heat our homes with fossil, we cannot produce electricity in that way, and then alternatives will be developed. That's not a big challenge, actually. Actually, we, we already know most of the technology we need for that. <clears throat> so, uh, so this sounds great, maybe. And when I say this to people, they say, well, that sounds great. But, but, uh, but it's not going to happen. People don't care, and politicians do nothing. That's false. People do care. Uh, we are now in a situation where a majority of people all over the world um, are, say that they think that climate change is for real. It's something that we need to do something about. That's true most everywhere in, in, in the world. And things are happening also. Politicians, it's not true that they don't do anything. Uh, so take EU, for example. In EU, we have had for, for more than a decade one of these emission trading systems, the rationing system, covering around half of emissions. From 2027, we're going to have a new uh, system covering the rest. Then we will basically cover all the CO2 emissions done in the Union. And the number of, of these rationing cards uh, that are distributed will fall over time. And with the current speed of reduction of the number that enters the market, it will be zero in 2042. And then uh, all fossil cars have to be uh, non-fossil. Uh, flying has to be non-fossil. Heating our homes and everything has to be non-fossil. So things are happening. Uh, in other parts of the world, take for example China, uh, we see that the majority of cars sold now are, are electric. We also see that the amount of energy produced with sun and wind is exploding. It's true that in some countries of the world we see some setbacks, but even there it seems extremely unlikely that the trend toward less uh, emissions is, is going to be reversed. And if you think about developing countries, the idea that the development strategy should be coal-based, no one believes in that, basically, anymore. 
Uh, so good things are happening. It looks much better now than it, it did five or ten years ago. Uh, so finally, what, what, what should one do as an individual if you think about these things? Um, uh, here, I would like to point to two things that I think is important for every one of us as individuals. One is don't lose faith. If we don't believe that the transition is going to happen, it's, that it's going to be possible, then that's most likely going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we need to think that it's possible. This doesn't mean that we should be naive and, and, and don't realize that there are practical problems that need to be solved along the way. But believe that it's possible. The second thing uh, that I think is important for everyone is that we need to be open to, to trying new ways of solving or satisfying our needs. Uh, I don't believe that, that, the, that the transition is going to require a lot of sacrifices. In fact, I think that when you try new things, you're going to find out that it works pretty well, even if, whether it relates to driving electric vehicles, heating our homes in new ways, or having new dishes on the table. Try them. If you don't like it, don't force yourself. But if you don't try, you're not going to know whether you like it or not. So be open, try. Uh, I think that humans are curious, and I think that we are able of solving all the practical problems that we are facing. So that's why I'm, I am optimistic. I believe that the third door is still open, so let's go through it. Thank you.